Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Botany Bistro. I'm so excited to have you join us today. This is our 21st episode, and we're going to be talking about agronomy. My name is Mary Dudley, and I'm the Ecology Education Manager at the Civic Garden Center. We're located in Cincinnati in the Avondale neighborhood, and we've been around for 80 years helping people learn how to garden sustainably, connect with others who are in the community. If you're in Cincinnati, I highly recommend that you come and visit us. It is beautiful, almost spring, just a couple more weeks and we have flowers blooming we have all sorts of fun activities going on as we get our gardens ready for the coming seasons and if you're not in cincinnati then i hope that you are starting to enjoy some of your pre-spring activities uh, whether that is seed starting or just kind of scouting out your orchard and doing a little bit of pruning maybe thinking about putting in some new projects like a rain garden or a rain barrel at your home and so we're here to help you with all of those things. Check us out if you want to know more on our website. And thank you so much for tuning in. So the Botany Bistro is a series of bite-sized botany classes that we developed to really bring some of this foundational knowledge to the public. And we want to provide this knowledge for free. It is just kind of a taste of all the different aspects of botany. It's definitely not exhaustive. There's so much more we could talk about, uh, but we're really happy to kind of get started and hopefully jumpstart your curiosity so that you take it to the next level. We need more people in the field of botany, horticulture, landscaping, agronomy, which we'll talk about today. And the field is growing no pun intended. Uh, there's definitely spaces for people that are interested in this kind of work. So please join us today. Uh, come along for the ride. If you're joining us on your lunch break, there's no need to worry about having to sit in front of a screen during that time. We want you to be out and enjoying the wonderful weather. Uh, go for a walk. I'm not going to have any um, visuals to show you that are required. I'll be talking through everything for you today. Uh, so we really want you to just take this at your own pace and enjoy all the time that you have. And thank you for sharing some of the time that you are spending with us. Um, and so let's recap on some things that have been previously uh, discussed on the Bistro. We most recently wrapped up a two-part series about ethnobotany. I really enjoyed that session with uh, Abby Artemisia. She was our most recent guest. And I learned so much about right relationship during those sessions. We've also discussed paleobotany, and we had a wonderful guest, Dr. Ryberg, was on with us to talk about fossil plants and what we can learn from these amazing fossils that are being unearthed. We've discussed some plant breeding and genetics. We'll also pick up that conversation a little bit today, but we'll be diving more into that during our April sessions when we discuss biotechnology. So stay tuned for more on those. Uh, we've discussed plant pathology, physiology, systematics and taxonomy, anatomy and morphology, along with a few like just kind of basic botanies to get you started. So if you're feeling like you're a little behind and you want to catch up, don't worry. There's lots of time. Everything's on our YouTube channel for you. And if you have any questions, please do get in touch. All right. So uh, every session I try to uh, highlight what I'm having for lunch. It is lunch hour after all. Um, and during these live sessions, uh, we will have time for discourse at the end. Um, but also, if you're not joining us live, please feel free to contact us uh, later and send us any questions that you might have or tag us on social media. And so our lunch today uh, is kind of simple, um, but I went for a little oatmeal today. It's a little chilly, but not too bad. Um, but I am still kind of dealing with a little bit of congestion. Uh, and so it was just, what sounds good to me today? But this is apple cinnamon oatmeal. It smells amazing. And I can't wait to dig into this. Um, but we are going to be thinking about uh, one of these crops during our talk today. And so that's a little teaser for you. I hope you're all enjoying a nice, uh, healthy meal. Um, we're just a snack as we uh, dive into this topic because it is all about food. So make sure you've got something close by uh, in case you need to satisfy a craving. 
Um, and so our lesson today is going to be an introduction to agronomy, which is the particular focus of botany that we're talking about today. Uh, we're going to talk about agricultural revolutions uh, throughout history. We're going to be identifying how agronomists have improved agricultural crops uh, using ver resistant varieties, soil testing, rotation, weed management, and buffers. So stay tuned for all of that great info today. If you want to mark your calendar now, on March 22nd, we will be following up this conversation with our 22nd uh, episode of Bistro, and I'll have a special guest on with me to discuss agronomy. I'll have a professional agronomist on um, so that we can go deeper into this topic. As I am not a professional agronomist, I um, have a botanical degree, an advanced botanical degree, but I have not been involved professionally in that field, and so uh, I'm really excited to get that expertise in with us. So. Uh, please plan to join us at noon on March 22nd if you'd like to be part of the live stream. Otherwise, you can catch us in our archives. Um, and so your homework, we always have homework on the Bistro, uh, is to think about your favorite agricultural crop. It could be a variety of things, um, but try to pick one out, tag us on social media uh, with that, and you can tag us at Civic Garden Center, uh, and we'll have that conversation and enjoy all of the different um, ideas that people have about their favorite agricultural crops, and I'm sure we'll hear about some interesting ones along the way. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into agronomy. So I'm saying this word uh, that you might not have heard before, but it's spelled A-G-R-O-N-O-M-Y. Agronomy. What do agronomists do? Well, they provide knowledge and leadership to growers, farmers in their assigned markets, while also performing duties such as field scouting, soil management, market analysis, the list kind of goes on. And so uh, as I'm preparing for these sessions and I'm doing the research, okay, agronomy, what is it very focused on? And really this field is fairly broad. It's not um, very specific like some of the other cell bios or, or other things that we've discussed. Um, and so an agronomist really needs to be able to look at an overall health of a certain grow area, uh, thinking about what the nutrient requirements of those crops are, and even the social factors and economic factors that will influence the policies that are in that region. So it's really ecological. If you kind of zoom out and you're thinking about all these different things and how they're working together. Um, and so I really appreciate that as the ecology education manager. Uh, we're going to be diving more into ecology, plant ecology in our um, May sessions. And so I don't want to um, you know, overshadow that right now or, or discuss that too much right now. Uh, but I did want to let you know that this is pretty wide. Um, so you have agronomists that are um, studying soils, studying plant interactions, studying lots of different things, and really putting all those puzzle pieces together to figure out how we can maximize yield and feed a growing population. Um, and so agronomists will ensure accurate knowledge of recommendations for growers to achieve that crop production. They'll sample soil in different fields and they'll do multiple depth sampling, they'll take soil cores, um, they will identify changes or maybe needs for changes that the farmers can implement in order to conserve their soil. They also do field trials and they will test out new varieties of plants that are being developed. Um, and so that's something that neat happens in growth chambers or in greenhouses or high tunnels, um, ecological research centers, and they are able to apply this knowledge. Often it takes many um, different trials and different research stations to be able to put all this information together before it is able to be disseminated to our farmers and make sure that they are getting the most up-to-date and accurate information. Um, they're also out in fields looking for um, pests, uh, different weeds that might be competing with the crop that is trying to be grown, uh, and thinking about irrigation practices. You know, what, what's your water flow look like? How can we make that more efficient and improve all of those infrastructure systems in order to help the farmers with their maximum yield? 
Uh, they also think about the timing and application of pesticides and herbicides in a field, depending on which certain crops they want to grow. And so all of this has kind of put together uh, a well-rounded opportunity for people that want to know more about plants uh, to be working in this field, uh, particularly as it pertains to commercial agriculture. So agronomists are folks that work with people that are doing value um, added goods and growing cash crops. Um, and so they'll work for medium to large scale farms, um, sometimes crop and seed production companies, also other companies that produce um, products for crops for protection. Um, they could work for government agencies doing evaluations and analysis, research for firms, environmental organizations, and also employed by colleges and universities. Uh, a lot of agronomists are researchers, and so they need to have access to these wonderful research facilities that we have at our secondary uh, educational institutions. Over the next five years, this job outlook is really strong. So if you're thinking about a career change and you're not sure what you're into quite yet, uh, you want to be outside, you want to work with science and other folks that are interested in this, this is a good job market. So keep your eyes open for this. Um, while most agronomists are specialists in crop and soil science, as well as ecology, they're also looking very deeply about nutrients, timing, um, ways that climate is affecting the growth of these crops um, and how they can best understand management of different pests, um, all while trying to protect the environment in sustainable ways. And so um, I know we all might have our own opinions about agriculture, industrial agriculture. Uh, maybe some of us don't have any up close personal connection to it. Um, but at the same time, we're all benefiting from the productivity of these systems because we have food security and we're able to export quite a bit of food to other countries. And so that stability and security is a result of the hard work of agronomists over many generations. Um, and so agronomic crops, crops can also be grouped together. And so you might have an agronomist that specializes in one, two or three crops. Um, some of them specialize in more or more generalist, but our major crops grown here in the United States are soybeans, corn, wheat, hay, cotton, grain, sorghum, rice, oats, and barley. So some of you might've been like, ah, oats. She's having oatmeal today. Um, and so that's our tie-in for our wonderful lunch. I can still smell that amazing cinnamon. It's wonderful. Um, and so the kind of birth, I guess, of this field um, goes along with the birth of agriculture, traditional agriculture. Um, and so we've been cultivating plants for at least 12,000 years, um, kind of heavily. And so that's kind of the first start of this um, agricultural revolution. And that's when we stopped hunting, gathering as much. We started cultivating plants, started planting plants. Um, and so those were the first agronomists. What's going on in this soil? How do I get the seeds to germinate? How do I make sure that I have plants that are reliable from year to year? Or, oh, this one looked much bigger and grew much faster. How do I save the genetics of that plant? So this has been going on for a really long time. And so we want to thank the folks that have started this research that we're standing on the shoulders of and we continue to develop what they have laid down. Um, the second agricultural revolution was really industrialization um, and privatization of a lot of common areas. So as we moved away from using common grazing areas or farming areas and put those into private hands and then you had just one or two people making decisions on how that area was being managed um, with the addition of lots of new tech, steel plows, um, harvesting machines, that all was part of the second agricultural revolution. So we most recently had what they call the third agricultural revolution. And that you might also know as the green revolution. What the green revolution really was, was a period of transfer of technology, um, which saw greatly increased crop yields. Most of this was the development of genetically modified organisms or GMOs. Um, in addition to the application of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. 
This was happening in the late 1960s, and farmers were incorporating these new high-yielding varieties, particularly in the cereals, so our grains, um, of dwarf wheat and rice, um, and using chemical fertilizers to produce high yields. Um, the new varieties that they were growing were more dependent on these chemical fertilizers in order to produce the yields that were being advertised. Um, we also had an increase in use of pesticides to reduce, reduce crop loss due to pests um, and better irrigation methods. So the mechanization, all these different parts working together um, really created this green revolution. So the green revolution um, has some not so great things about it. Um, and you can probably guess from what I have just mentioned, uh, the increased use of chemical fertilizers has you know, been a pollutant in our waterways um, and a, an issue that we are dealing with. We're also you know, trying to figure out integrated pest management as the use of pesticides has produced resistant varieties of um, pests that don't respond to pesticides. And so then you're using more and more and um, trying to do different combinations of these um, chemical applications. So that hasn't been super great. Um, and also the reduction in biodiversity. Once you standardize and mechanize agriculture, um, you know, you want that same height of crop to be there so that you can use the tractor that you bought. You can use all of the um, additions that you have. And so over time, we've just come to realize, okay, this was initially, uh, you know, kind of this amazing change with the amount of yield that was produced and has been touted as saving billions of lives from starvation. Um, but now we're kind of taking a step back and saying, okay, this was, you know, it, it was a start. Um, and now we need to swing the pendulum back a little bit to more sustainable practices that we can use over time. And agronomists have been right there throughout that whole process and have started to see some of the detrimental effects of the Green Revolution and have been there to try to solve those issues as well. Just as they have since the first seeds were planted, um, it really is in all of our best interest to have soils that sustain life uh, and making sure that we are considering how our actions are affecting the next generation. So um, there were some good things about it. There's some not so good, so good, good things about it. And now it's our job to kind of take those good things um, and try to integrate them into a larger, more holistic plan that we can use moving forward. And so you might have heard the terms of permaculture, um, biodynamics, regenerative agriculture, organics. Uh, these are coming to the surface now as we are looking for alternative ways to keep our high crop yields. We still need to feed this growing population. And as the population grows, we tend to lose more opportunities for land that we will grow on. So we have this um, situation where we're having, oh, more, more mouths to feed, but less land to feed them on. Um, and we really wanna make sure that the people that are farming on these properties are doing it in a way that will be able to continue to do that for many generations. So really keeping our natural resources healthy is something that all growers really strive for um, while they're also trying to hit that bottom line. So uh, these things are all happening in the world of agriculture right now. It's a very exciting time if you want to get involved, um, even if you're just doing something small to start, little niche crops. Urban agriculture is very necessary to kind of stem some of the food deserts that we're dealing with. Um, and these processes that agronomists are using on large scale farms uh, can trickle down to us. And so I'll include um, a situation of that, an example of that in a little bit. But as we start to talk about different case studies, I want us to just recognize that there are so many different factors that are involved and they're all influenced by the particular location where you're trying to grow and what you're trying to grow and the resources available to you. And so an agronomist is very place-based. Um, even the ones that are working in greenhouses or growth chambers, you know, those seem maybe that they're uh, more artificial and they can kind of be located anywhere, but really they're still focused on a particular climate that they're trying to apply these research methods to or a particular species um, that they are working with. So it's very cool to kind of see the specialization happening at that level. It's at the individual level. 
Um, and so within the field of agronomy, you can definitely be quite a specialist, even though I mentioned before that it's kind of a general field. There's lots of different spaces and niches to get involved. One of the case studies that I chose was aphid resistance. So a lot of us probably know what aphids look like. There's those little green bugs that really kind of cover our stems of plants. Um, if they get kind of bad, if you don't notice them coming in early, um, they can kind of have this little infestation. They can turn a little bit yellow, um, maybe even like an orange tint at times, but they kind of start off green. Um, and the, our ladybug larvae like to eat them. So sometimes people will uh, practice integrated pest management and includes releasing ladybug larvae. Um, so that they can try to eat the little aphids. Other times you're brushing them off. Or, um, several states in the Midwest that are the top soybean producers in the country. And uh, there is a soybean aphid, a specific soybean aphid, um, that is a very damaging pest and can cause billions of dollars in crop losses every year. And so this was an issue that agronomists wanted to take a closer look at. And a recent study have, has found that um, there are some natural resistance in certain soybean varieties. And so looking at crops that are showing signs of soybean aphid damage compared with crops that have less or almost no damage um, growing relatively close to each other, you can say, oh, okay, there's something going on in this other plant that I want to study. And so what they're trying to do is isolate some of these genes that are in the plants that are resistant to say, okay, how can we introduce these resistant genes to some of the other soybean varieties that we are growing? Um, and this is gonna be really important moving forward because if you are, identify the natural resistance, you're not as dependent on these chemical pesticides that we are spraying on our plants, which are damaging some of the natural pollinators that we like uh, to have around and are also not good for the workers to be um, handling all the time. And you just have a lot of precautions that you need to implement if you're gonna be using pesticides. Um, and so these uh, agronomists at the University of Minnesota um, have a goal to limit insecticide use. Um, since there are some aphid populations that are showing resistance to these insecticides, so they really want to look at it a little bit different way. And the soybean aphid is genetically diverse and can quickly overcome plant resistance as well. So it's not like a resistant plant is never gonna get aphid damage. Um, that can still happen, but uh, it's important to identify new sources of this resistance. So plants evolve as well as the critters. Um, and so you're kind of playing catch up. We're trying to see what's going on under the surface. Um, they have tested thousands of varieties of soybeans uh, for aphid resistance and getting that genetic information. They've found several genetic landmarks that are common in aphid resistant soybean varieties. Um, and some of them are in regions that they might be able to manipulate and put into other varieties that are not as resistant. Um, and so multiple resistance genes could be bred into single soybean varieties to really give those soybeans a lot of different tools in their toolbox uh, to be able to protect them from aphid damage. And so that's just one study, one, one research project that's happening that is focused on a particular crop and a particular pest and really trying to mitigate the damage that's being done to crops in that way. Um, there's also some cool tech coming out of this research. Um, and so a different researcher from Texas um, has been using a portable x-ray fluorescence spectrometer in the field. And so this tool can give within a minute, two minutes, um, fairly accurate results about what elements are found in the soil. And so plants need elements like calcium, magnesium, nitrogen, iron, phosphorus, um, to be able to be healthy. And so uh, we need to identify what soils are lacking those items so that we are adding the right things. But also we don't want to over add. You don't wanna just be blanket adding fertilizer all the time. It's expensive and it's not good for the environment. Um, so really pinpointing what areas of my farm need this 
uh, addition and when and how often? And those are all very important questions that need to be answered. Um, and so as they are taking these soil samples, typically they will take a soil core, which will go down several feet into the ground, and it'll come up with this long kind of like soil worm looking thing. Um, but you're really getting into the root zone, what's happening down deep, um, and maybe even thinking about the minerals that are being pulled up by some of the plants. And so that soil testing still needs to happen. This portable device does not replace a full-on lab soil test, but it does give immediate information that can be very useful to farmers and growers before they get those lab results. They can start to make plans, and uh, when they get those results confirming what has been known, or maybe even adding additional information, they're ready for some strategies. Um, this also is important to think about for very you know, rural areas or developing countries that might not have access to labs close by. And so that time that it takes to collect the sample, send it to a lab and get results um, can be a long time. And so you really kind of want that information to be uh, given to you quickly. So the United States Department of Agric Agriculture the USDA and the NRCS, which is our Natural Resources Conservation Science staff, um, will go out into the field and dil dig these soil cores. Um, and then they can understand the properties happening in those root zone. The spectrometer they actually put onto these soil cores and they'll just lay it right on there and it will take an x-ray and analyze that soil sample. It's amazing. It's like pretty much magic. Um, finding out what's in your texture, your pH, your salinity, and other properties like that. Um, so be on the lookout for new, new tools that we can use uh, to really give ourselves the information and the data that we need to be sustainable growers. Some of you have probably heard about crop rotation before. Um, if you haven't, then here it is in a nutshell. Um, thinking about how your plants are uptaking different minerals and nutrients within the soil um, really is important because we can't be growing the same plant in the same place year after year and expect the same results. So, oh my gosh, my tomatoes did amazing in my brand new raised bed at my community garden. I'm gonna do the exact same thing this year. Okay, well, the calcium and the nitrogen and the magnesium, the, the things that that plant needed, it took from the soil. It didn't probably take all of it, um, but there's definitely less of those things in that soil now than there were before you planted those tomatoes. And so how are you going to replenish that soil? Well, you have a couple of choices. You can add fertilizers. Um, you can kind of give it some compost and some rest. You can also practice crop rotation. And so I live uh, in Ohio, in the Midwest, and I have seen this happen a lot ever since I was young, um, which is this rotation between corn and soybeans. Soybeans are a legume in the legume family, and so they are able to fix nitrogen in the soil and they take it from the air, they fix it and they put it into these nodules around their roots. They work with mycorrhizal uh, beneficial bacteria that associate with their roots. And so then they have this available nitrogen in the soil for the next crop, which is corn, which is very, very nitrogen hungry. Um, and so the corn uses all that nitrogen for all of its beautiful green growth and those stalks and those leaves. Um, and then we rotate back in the soybeans because we're like, oh, we need more nitrogen available for our next corn crop, but it's an every other year thing. Now the development of all these different products that we're using from soy really kind of came out of a need to use this crop um, to be able to grow this crop and have it be economically as viable as corn so that farmers will be able to afford to practice crop rotation. Um, so this is really cool stuff that people are thinking about. How can we use plants um, that are naturally good at rebuilding soils, that are holding on to um, nutrients and sharing nutrients? How can we leverage that into our agricultural practices? Um, so that is just one example of crop rotation. There are also uh, cover crops that people will use in order to 
uh, kind of boost their soils, give things back to the soil in between their growing seasons. So a cover crop is not a crop that you would necessarily plan to sell, um, but you would use it to rejuvenate your soils in some way. And so hairy vetch and cereal rye are pretty common cover crops. They capture nutrients, including nitrogen from the air and the soil. Um, and when these cover crops decompose, they release these nutrients. So uh, that the cash crops such as corn, soybeans can use them and thrive. But they obviously do this at different rates at different times in different ways. They're different species. And so understanding those subtle differences will help us apply the best knowledge that we can moving forward. And so there's a new research study that is looking at the amount of time it takes certain cover crops to release those nutrients. And so they specifically focused on hairy vetch and cereal rye, which are the most commonly planted cover crops in the Midwest. Um, they found that hairy vetch and cereal rye had very different release rates for their nitrogen specifically. Um, and nitrogen is a, a big one. Those green leaves need nitrogen. So that's what these researchers focused on. The study showed that hairy vetch released more nitrogen overall as compared to cereal rye and much quicker. Um, and so when they think about the timing, they, um, the researcher Rachel Cook was quoted to say, hairy vetch releases almost all available nitrogen in the first four weeks after it is terminated, so after it has been sliced and uh, allowed to start to decompose, which is that four week uh, window is fairly short um, and it's before the major time of nitrogen uptake by the corn that would be planted after it, which needs it about eight weeks after planting. So now you have this, okay, we have a, we have a cover crop idea. We need a slower release of this nitrogen, or we need to wait to terminate this plant so it's a little bit closer in time. How are we gonna, how are we gonna manage it? Um, and so they determined that terminating the hairy vetch too early can cause losses of nitrogen before the crop can take it up, before that corn can take it up. Um, whereas cereal rye releases nitrogen slowly over multiple weeks. They had several different test sites that they were testing this out at. Um, in Illinois, and they were planting study plots with either cereal rye or vetch, and then they would terminate them with an herbicide, and then they would plant corn and soybeans respectively, so that they had all these different uh, experiments that they were running so that they could really tell what was happening in the soil. Um, they were measuring the growth of the cover crops, how quickly they decomposed, and the quantity and rate of nitrogen that they were releasing. They found overall that hairy vetch uh, released three times as much nitrogen as compared to cereal rye, and that more than 70% of the total nitrogen released by hairy vetch occurred within the first two weeks after termination, contrasted with the nitrogen release from cereal rye, which uh, had almost no net release in the first four weeks after termination. So uh, this is cool. This is science. This is like getting out there and having these plants speak to us, getting the data that we need so the plants can tell us how they're performing, what they're doing, and then we can apply all of that information to our future studies. Um, I also wanted to mention, as we're talking about crops and rotation, cover crops, uh, tillage. So um, I used to live uh, in Oxford, Ohio on Brown Road over by Houston Woods, and there was a farm behind our house. Um, and they would till their crops, their, their fields before planting. And tilling basically is kind of putting in a sharp uh, plow part and kind of moving that earth up. And so you've probably heard that, oh, I need to till. Uh, you know, I need to kind of flip the soil on top of itself. And then you've got this beautiful canvas for planting. Uh, well, now we know that tilling is not always a good idea. Um, and is not usually necessary. So trying to relearn and reteach some of these cultural practices that we have can be fairly difficult, um, but we ha they've noticed uh, and taken account that farmers pr con practicing conventional till um, use about six gallons of diesel fuel per acre each year. 
You can contrast that with no-till, which requires less than two gallons per acre. So that's a pretty significant savings um, per acre. And so across the country, this difference leads to nearly 282 million gallons of diesel fuel that can be saved annually by farmers who are practicing no-till instead of the conventional till. Um, and so all of this kind of trickles down. Even if farmers are practicing a combination of till, no-till, um, they really are seeing a time savings, uh, energy savings, cash savings. Um, and so just kind of putting this information out there and reassuring you know, farmers that this information is coming from scientists that are studying this in their best interest um, has been really, really helpful. And so this also reduces soil erosion, increases biological activity in the soil and organic matter. Um, so this is something that is you know, changing the way that we traditionally thought about how we needed to practice agriculture. I have just another, I have another uh, case study for you. Um, I've got two more actually, uh, and then we'll wrap up. So grain sorghum was one of the major crops that I mentioned. Um, it's not something that I am as familiar with uh, coming from Ohio as um, you would be maybe if you were in one of the Great Plains in states such as Kansas. Um, but it's drought tolerant and it is a very valuable crop because it is producing a gluten-free grain, which is very useful. Um, and so one of the research projects that's happening with this crop is to try to understand how we can reduce the competition from weeds growing around this crop uh, in order to make sure that the crop that you want to grow has everything that it needs to grow. So we don't want weeds to be competing for sunlight, nutrients. Uh, we want to make sure that the water that we're watering our plants goes to our plants and not to the weeds. Um, so what are some strategies for folks? Uh, we need to reduce these weeds and it's best to do it in an integrated way. Um, these researchers were looking at what particular weeds are really causing these problems and how do we need to approach solutions. Um, and so they found that grass weeds were most detrimental and caused the most crop loss. So that's giant foxtail, barnyard grass, and large crab grass are particularly the ones that they're focusing on in this study. Um, and so they want to understand when an herbicide should be applied. These herbicides can be very expensive, time consuming to apply. You don't want to be doing it too much. Um, and you really want to conserve that resource. And so knowing when that plant is going to be accepting that herbicide, when that growth stage is happening is really important. Um, and so the goal of the research is to try to reduce weed growth while maximizing the yield of the sorghum. They're measuring leaf area using leaf area machines. Cool, I didn't know, it's like a scanner. You like put a leaf on, you can measure leaf area. And that determines how much the weeds are competing with the crop for nutrients, water, sunlight. All right, my last example is very timely. Um, it has been raining for the last couple of days here in Cincinnati. Um, but it's also been a little bit warmer. The weather's been nice. I know a lot of gardeners want to get out in their garden. Um, I'm going to tell you, please wait. Uh, working in a wet area, wet garden area can damage soil structure, can cause compaction. Um, you really don't want to be working in your garden or fields when they are wet. Um, so we want those to be able to dry out. Now, this is, ooh, you know, it's time. I feel like I want to put my seeds in the ground. Um, you can start your seeds inside. You can do some more inside uh, dreaming and planning and uh, looking through your seed catalog. So do that. Um, but, you know, most of us are not trying to grow food for a million people. Um, and so that's, you know, stress of, okay, I need to get my stuff in the ground, but I can't get my equipment onto the field. Um, or I know that the field really is too wet for planting, but I, I, I don't know, I want to get started. So how do we handle our moist springs uh, with kind of flat topography? Uh, we have those rains and snow melts right when we're wanting to plant our crops. So if we're able to plant earlier in the spring, it elongates the growing season um, and could possibly increase crop yields because it has more opportunities to grow before we need to be harvesting. 
Um, and so one of the best solutions that folks were finding in order to be able to get out in their fields a little bit earlier is to put in drains below the soil that will collect that excess water and direct it somewhere else to an existing stream or a pond. Um, and so really trying to dry out your fields by moving that water away. Um, and then the soil dries out a little bit faster, the seeds don't rot, um, and farmers can get into their fields earlier. So a lot of tile, drainage tile, was installed in farms all over the country. And so this seemed to be a really great solution to this issue. Well, um, a few years after the installation of a significant number of tile, uh, there were problems that people were finding. Um, starting to notice in local streams and waterways, even as far away as the Gulf of Mexico, um, this addition of fertilizer runoff. Nitrates were coming along with the water from these fields and polluting our local waterways. Um, and so too many chemicals getting into the streams, which is harming all of these water sources. Um, and so what did they do? Um, and so they're not just sitting back saying like, oh, that's somebody else's problem. That's not my problem. You know, we do need to figure this out upstream. And so one of the neat implementations that's been happening are these um, denitrifying wood chip bioreactors. And so I know the term bioreactor because it's kind of this new composting technology that people are very excited about. Um, you create these kind of donut shaped um, compost areas. Um, I don't know how else to say it really, um, but you're able to kind of pack a lot of organic material in there. You let it decompose with the help of microbes and decomposers over time. You open it up and you use that compost. Um, and so I was like, oh, bioreactors. I think I know what is going on here. But this was a new one for me. And so um, they're thinking about how we can use natural systems to kind of clear out those nitrates before they get into our waterways. And the main issue that they were finding was that, you know, this water used to infiltrate the soil and then travel slowly into the watershed, into the areas of water that it would naturally have gone in. But that movement of the water through the soil gave bacteria time to neutralize those nitrates. So the water did not enter into these soil areas anymore. They were being directly piped to waterways and there was no opportunity for the bacteria to interact with those nitrates and neutralize and break them down. So they've been putting in these wood chip bioreactors on the edges of fields and also kind of breaking up that drainage tile in other areas to provide this kind of soil buffer so that when that excess water is drained, it doesn't carry with it all of those additional nitrates that are polluting our waterways. Um, and so this wood chip bioreactor is essentially a large trench filled with wood chips. Um, farmers then direct their drainage to move through the trench before it gets to a stream or waterway. Um, sometimes these can be as big as a third of the size of a football field, so we're not necessarily talking about something small, although that can also work depending on the flow that you have to deal with. Um, and then they're filling that trench in with wood chips and then they're covering that trench with some soil. There's also some aeration tubes that they can add um, into that process to just make sure that it doesn't get compacted and that you have lots of air available for aerobic digestion, all those great critters, um, biological species, those bacterial species um, that we want to be in there doing that work. So as the water moves through these bioreactors, the bacteria are able to change those nitrates into nitrogen gas, which is not as harmful um, for our waterways. Because bacteria are doing the work in these systems, it's called a bioreactor. 
And so I learned something, <laughs> um, something that is being applied to large scale agriculture that we are using here in our urban setting um, on a smaller scale indeed. Um, but at the same time, it's a really cool concept that agronomists have gifted to us. They do need to be kind of upkept every 10 years or so. You need new wood chips in there so that you have kind of a new food source for that bacteria that we're looking for uh, to do this work for us. But it's a really neat process and something that you know people are trying to implement so that they can reduce some of the environmental degradation that we're seeing. This is the thought that I wanna leave you with today. So we all in this country are benefiting from the high yielding agricultural practices that we are implementing. Whether we want that to be organic food or conventional, you know, we're all really trying to sustain life. And it is estimated that in the year 2050, there will be 9.7 billion mouths to feed on this planet, um, which is going to require a really interdisciplinary, interconnected community approach to how we're going to be fed and how we can utilize our current amount of resources and make food available to everyone that needs it. Um, and so we're going to need to think about population growth trends, climate change, as that changes the different things that we're able to do in different areas of the world, resources and how they might be constrained uh, over time, food distribution, um, and just the kind of social economics of how it works to be able to have an equitable food stable society. Um, so some key strategies that agronomists are looking for and looking at as they develop more um, advice is to look really hard at sustainable agriculture, um, crop improvement biotech, which we're going to talk about uh, in April, precision agriculture and digital technologies using drones to uh, identify different areas on crop land that need attention, and food waste reduction. Uh, we waste a lot of food in this country, up to a quarter of the food that is produced. And a lot of the food that is produced is also not meant for human consumption, but is for animal consumption. And so thinking about how we are impacting that availability of food with the choices that we make um, is really hitting home. Uh, so as we kind of look forward to 2050 and the population growth that we expect to happen, uh, we also need to be uh, involved in our food system. So that's kind of what I wanted to leave you with today is just that call to action to get involved in your food system, understand where that food is coming from, the work that went into those products, the farmers that are doing the growing, the scientists that are analyzing the soil and all of the ecological interactions for that particular crop, um, and how can we make positive change so that we all have access to food uh, for many years to come. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on the next Bistro.